Okay, good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at uh, Laguna Hills Nursery on a Saturday morning. It's June, was it today, 17th, and it's actually warm. <laughs> it's not cold today. We're about a month behind, I think, on temperature. So uh, normally this time of year we'd have dragon fruit ripe. I had to buy this at the supermarket because nothing on our trees, they're just starting to bloom now. So, uh, yeah, so normally we'd do this in Mar May and have the dragon fruit cuttings available at the end, but we knew last month uh, at this time it was too cold to start the cuttings outside. So um, it's, it's, it's time now. So dragon fruit, one of the up and coming fruits, it's been around a long time. These are native to Central and South America, Northern South America. They're from the tropics. Uh, they do like warmer weather than we normally have. So if you're inland about five more miles or you know, behind the foothills here, uh, that's a little better climate for them. Uh, around here, the coolness delays them a little bit, but they still tend to, or like last summer was about five degrees warmer than normal. We actually had about five or six crops uh, during the year. So dragon fruit, one nice thing about it, they'll start blooming normally about May and they'll bloom about every couple months all the way the rest of the year. So like last year we had fruit ripening all the way into midwinter. So um, depends on the heat, you know, more heat, uh, more sun. Now around here we don't get too hot. If you're in, a, um, say, Menifee, most of the dragon fruit there is grown under about 40 to 50 percent shade cloth. Or one of our friends said underneath queen palm fronds so that this dappled sun so it's not quite as hot because they do tend to sunburn in extreme heat now if you haven't eaten dragon fruit before now this is from a supermarket it said red I have no idea what color this is inside and they're right it is well it's a pink one a deep pink So it's green when it's forming, uh, and there are varieties that pick up just a little bit of pink. You'll, you'll know it as you grow them. This one apparently turns pretty much totally pink, and usually I wait two or three days after it turns pink. Now it only takes, like if you're in um, Elsinore, from flower to picking the fruit may only be 50 days. Really quick turnover. Here, 60, 70 days. It's a little cooler here, so they're a little bit slower, um, but still uh, quite fast for any fruit to do it in two months. So the other nice thing about dragon fruit, if you haven't eaten it before, is that the fruit, the skin itself is a nice way to protect it, and it peels really easy like a shower cap. So it comes off real cleanly. The seeds are so small, you won't notice them, although you can grow plants from the seeds. Uh, when you eat them, it's just like strawberry seeds. You won't notice them. And their flavor generally is somewhere between watermelon and kiwi. So there, there's a range. We'll go over some of the flavors. Usually we like the ones that are pink. So the original uh, species that was grown 40 years ago, we started growing these was the Hyloceris So the big white the big fruit with the white flesh is Hyloceris undatus but they've crossed with other species of uh, dragon fruit that have some have burgundy flesh and that's how they got these fluorescent ones as they started crossing them this one generally, to most people, tastes like a slightly overripe watermelon. So not great, but not bad. Certainly the hotter the weather, the sweeter they get. This last year, I enjoyed eating these a lot because we had the heat. Uh, some years it just hasn't, it doesn't have much flavor. Uh, but the ones with the fluorescent pink flesh tend to be the highest rated ones. Um, the ones with the darker flesh, sometimes those are the sweetest, but they're also smaller fruits. 
So they, this is about a um, three quarter pound, maybe one pound fruit. Uh, the white ones can get up to two. Uh, the dark red ones sometimes only half a pound or you know, like that big. One person eat that. These we usually share. So they were brought, they became famous actually in uh, Malaysia first, Vietnam. Uh, back in the 1800s, they got shipments, I guess, from Mexico or Central America, and they became famous in Malaysia before they got famous here. In fact, uh, my first dragon fruit, a, a Vietnamese gentleman brought me what they called the Vietnamese white and uh, got fruit on it. So the way we grow these, uh, typically when you see them on farms, the most common thing they do is in California at least, they put them in 15 gallon buckets or they plant them in the ground. I mean, the one that puts them in 15 gallon buckets says that they have to do this because they have too many gophers and the gophers will eat the roots. So they put them in 15 gallon buckets. Sometimes gophers eat right through the buckets. Um, but in a 15 gallon, they would put on a pretty strong support. At least this is minimum two, two by two. Now the, there's a lot of people who grow them in the ground and they will for a more permanent when you have wood sticking in wet dirt uh, this can rot away within five years or even sooner so most of them for a more permanent display and if you're in asia it's so wet there they don't hardly even use wood at all um, but some of the nice ones we've seen in people's yards They'll put a concrete footing into the ground. And then they'll put a four by four redwood post about uh, five foot tall. You don't want to be too high. I mean, if it's the dragon fruit tends to grow up the stake and arch off. So if it's too tall, the, they experimented with first with six footers and they found out, well, it's hard to reach that fruit on top. So now they do, uh, say, a five foot stake on top of a concrete pier or footing. And then they'll put, and if this is a four by four, then they can put up to four different dragon fruit cuttings. So you start this cutting on one side and then it just grows up. It's, it does cling. so. Dragon fruit clings to everything. And it brings a good piece with roots on it. Um, they have aerial roots, not unlike this, that attach to pretty much everything they, that you put them, lean them against. And then what most of them do is they'll drill holes in the top of this post, going two directions. So they'll put rebar in two directions, and then they'll support. A lot of them put, um, a lot of people put either a bicycle wheel or a partial piece of a car tire up here so it's resting on top of this thing. And the dragon fruit then will branch out, and this kind of cushions it a little bit as it comes over the side. Dragon fruit usually have segments. You see the segment here. So this is just a stem. There's no leaves. The leaves are the little uh, thorns that stick in there. And they're tropical, so they like the soil to be moist. Now, they don't use as much water as a normal tree, but they don't like dry dirt either. I mean, they can take it, you can, you know, if you didn't water this for a year, it wouldn't be dead. It would just look a little shriveled, but it wouldn't die. So dragon fruit is a drought tolerant crop, but if you want fruit, you got to water it. Keep, it. keep the soil moist. And if you fertilize them, it, it's, it's real interesting on dragon fruit. They'll start turning a little bit yellow. You throw some fertilizer in that thing and the next day they're greener. It, it works so fast. It greens them up real quickly. And if you keep them moist and they're well rooted and everything, they'll grow 10 feet in one year. We've seen them do that. So they're, they're a fast growing cactus. 
Now when they're young, this is a, a young stem. You can see, and it's pretty light. Off the same plant, this is one of the oldest stems. So you can see the difference. This, there's no chance this is going to flower and fruit this year. This one will probably flower and fruit this year. So on a, on a cactus stem, on this dragon fruit stem, they have these nodes here where, where thorns are attached. There's nodes like it's heart shaped. Now, the way you tell it's up is that it is a heart shaped stem. So this is the top and this is the bottom because these folds are kind of like this. Um, but every place where there's a node, now this one was used up. You can see that there's something that broke off there. So every node on this stem can either make a flower and a fruit or it can make a new stem. And once they're all used up, then there's no use having the stem more. If all the nodes have been used up, then you need another, another stem. So the way we do cuttings, and we that's the way we usually sell these things from cuttings. I mean, you can buy a rooted plant like this. The problem with dragon food is it's heavy. It's all water. So if you get a bigger one, these things, you know, it's it's hard to it's hard to get them home in a pot. They just keep falling over. They can weigh sometimes in a five gallon bucket. If we have them in five gallon, they'll be 30, 40 pounds of water in that thing. So it's harder to handle. It's better, to, it's easier to buy a cutting, especially a thicker cutting like this or like that and start that. This thing can actually bloom and fruit this year. It's, it's so thick. So this one is probably thick enough. It can probably do that also. So now as long as the stem gets plenty of sunlight, it can flower and fruit, gets enough energy to flower and fruit. So the verticals um, can actually bloom and fruit too, although as they grow a top and it starts shading this, then that stops flowering and fruiting down here. You'll get most of your flowering, flowering and fruiting on the horizontal parts of the plant. And they, they keep growing. Most people will, what they'll do is they'll, every April or May, they'll cut cut all the new growth that's hanging too far down back to closer to the, closer to the structure. So this enables you to stay, you know, to, to get close to the center of the plant. I mean, I have a friend, now there's no rules on this. I have a friend who has horse property and he just grew his, you know, he just planted a dragon fruit in the ground and just let it grow. So you go over his house and this thing's like 30 foot across. It's a pile of stems about six foot tall. And he says, well, you know, I don't have to train it or anything. I just leave it on the ground and it makes, I can reach plenty of fruit. Of course, he can only reach maybe a quarter of the fruit he has on the whole plant. But he doesn't care. He doesn't really use the land for much, so it's fine. But if you want to be more you know, efficient, then you do it this way, where you can have a different um, dragon fruit variety on each side if you want coming up. Another one on this side coming up and over. And that's the most common way of doing it. Uh, there's a lot of growers grow them on just like grapes on a wire trellis. We just put them against our block wall in the back of the nursery and they climb the wall and use the wall as support. Yeah, so when we plant these, now you can see how they you put a stake on these. So it's nice to have some sort of support. When you plant a cutting, you don't want a stick in the ground too deep. You know, like this piece, you might have to stick it this deep to hold it upright, but really they don't need to be in the ground about an inch. So either lean it against something, a wall or something, or tie a stake like they did here to it and stick the stake in the ground deeper to hold it upright. So you hold that there and it roots out the bottom. Now, if, again, if it was any cooler, we would start this in a small black container first. And in fact, it might even root faster than that. When we grow in pots, we do use our top pot potting sole. 
which is heavy enough to hold them up. A lot of potting soles are just too light. <clears throat> They're not that picky about the type of potting sole, but uh, ours is a lot better. I mean, even this grower who doesn't usually use good soil, they've got a lot of sand in here because they know that needs to be heavy to hold the plants up. Now, when they first came out, they were growing them in the desert and they were just burning up. They, they're not quite uh, strong enough to go in the desert. Here, we usually put them in full sun. You won't see them burn too easily unless, you know, you get a cutting from one that's been growing in the shade. Then it might burn initially just because it was growing in the shade. So when these first came out, the growers told us, oh, you got to have them in partial shade. Well... A lot of people started putting them in between houses and were not getting good results. This is what happens when you grow a dragon fruit in total shade. The stems get really skinny. So you'll know you're, you're uh, in too much shade if the, they come out thin. This is in full on sun. This is over pavement. <clears throat> so that's what they should look like in full sun. And this is full shade. So... These are half a day of shade and half a day of sun. So they're kind of in between. And this is um, thick enough. We can get food off of these pretty well. But full sun, you do get the best. And again, they can fruit their first year if the stems are thick enough. If you get a thinner stem, sometimes it takes three or four years to get the thickness. <clears throat> But if you grow it more horizontally, that's fine. That, that helps them get thicker faster and, and fertilize and water a lot. Um, so the flowers on these, <clears throat> I could have picked one off our plants, but they are pretty spectacular. They're close related to uh, epiphyllums, uh, orchid cactus. So the flowers are about a foot across. And they have the female part in the middle. So if you do a cross section of a flower, the ovary um, already looks like a green fruit. It's already the ovary that's attached to the bottom of this thing already has the scales on it. <clears throat> it's almost half as big as this is. So that's why it doesn't take too long because the fruit is well formed. It's got the petals, the sepals, and then the, the stamens with the uh, pollen things on the ends and then the female fleshy parts in the middle of the stigma with the fleshy receptacle So they only they open in the evening five o'clock in the evening um, the pollen is right by morning <clears throat> and then um, if you have a lot of bees you know, a lot of, we used to be closer to a beehive and I'd go out there in the morning and there'd be like six or seven bees in each flower. You go, okay, I don't have to pollinate that thing. Around here, we don't have as many bees this year. For some reason, my, the rain might have messed up a lot of hives. <clears throat> now, some of them, as this flower closes, the, the pollen goes right to the female part and it works without you doing a thing. Uh, the white one is famous for that. So the original white one they say is self-fertile, self-pollinating. As the flower closes, these things touch the female part and it works. Uh, most growers who grow this for a living will go out in the morning and take a, a, a brush and a little cup and brush these and put it on the, the, the stigma part and they'll transfer pollen from flower to flower. They'll use different varieties just to make sure in case that uh, one doesn't have good pollen that they'll you know most people who grow dragon fruit will have a white one around because the white one's supposed to have the best pollen <clears throat> then uh, some some of the dragon fruit experts will say well they cut these off and put them in the cup at night and then by the next morning it's released the pollen into the cup and then just go around and put a paintbrush on the uh, the stigma and transfer it that way but when we were in a growing ground in Irvine we were about a half mile from six beehives and there were so many bees in those flowers in the morning 
So the flowers usually close by about 10 or 11 in the morning. <clears throat> if it's cloudy, they'll stay open a little longer. But I go there in the morning and there's so many bees, I didn't have to do that. Uh, when, the, when there's enough bee activity, we get about two out of three flowers going to fruit. If you don't have any bees around, it might be one out of five. Uh, make it to fruit. So it's nice to either do it by hand or or have some bees around And first bloom usually is May and last bloom is usually November and they The different plants will be at different cycles, so Any questions on culture so we, we usually do cut them back because they keep on growing. Uh, one of our customers was from Korea, and in Korea, they grow them, but they have to bring the stems inside for the winter because it's too cold there in the winter. It snows. So what they would do is they would have a, showed me her setup at her house, and they still did the same thing here because they're used to that. They would have a stem that was about like this, but six foot long, and they would pull it out of the ground every winter, store it in the garage, and every spring they would put it back into the ground and they'd have it leaning about this angle toward so the sun was hitting it flush against the metal um, support. And they showed me they were getting about a dozen fruit on each stem and they'd line up a dozen stems uh, and get quite a few fruit. But uh, they would do that every year. I said, you don't have to do that every year, but that's, they were used to it. That's what they did in their homeland, so they would do the same thing here. They would take the stems, bring them inside for the winter, and then put them back outside, redo the soil a bit, put them back in the same spot, and grow them for the next year. In a pot, uh, you'd probably get about 10, 12 years of life, maybe a little bit longer. I had a one in a pot that I planted about 2008 and it just died after uh, it's about 15 years so you can you know when they get say 10 years old you might want to just take a stem off and start a new plant into that pot in the ground they can live longer now I have uh, the ones I have in the back were started 2012 or 13, but they're rooted in the ground through the pots, so they should keep on going. Yes. So we, when I do a proper cutting, I'll put the date on it. Now. We've heard anywhere of waiting from two days to seven days to put these in the ground. So this wound, if you put it directly into the dirt, the moment you cut it, it'll probably, if the dirt's moist too, it'll probably rot and, you, and you'll lose that end. Then you'll have to recut it again. So usually we cut them at the joints because they say they found that roots a little faster at the joint than if you cut it in the middle of the stem. But these weren't cut. I don't think these were cut at joints. You can see they cut that right in the middle. So that's fine, too. If you cut it in the middle, after about a week, the wound kind of closes up. And they'll root from there, too. But uh, most of the people who've done a lot of testing will tell you that it roots a little faster from the joint than it does from the center of the stem. But you can, you know, you can make, what, three or four cuttings out of this one piece if you really want to. <clears throat> Especially if you're putting a little pot like this for sale, you know, they don't want a big giant piece sticking out. So they just put a, a small piece in there. We've also seen, we've also gotten plants from a tissue culture lab, but we don't, when they're tissue culture grown, the piece, the stem we get is like that big. <laughs> and it doesn't look like it's gonna fruit for about five years, the size of that thing we get it. But uh, tissue culture, you can multiply it faster. You can, you know, from one, from one cell at the end of the stem, you can make thousands and thousands of baby plants. So uh, it's, it's faster than doing from cuttings, but uh, then you have to wait longer to get the fruit. So. Do you have an older dragon fruit plant that's never produced? 
Not that I can think of. Probably start fresh, only in that last year was one of the best years you've ever seen for dragon fruit production. It was hot. I mean, we started out in February, 80 degrees, in April, 100 degrees, and we got more dragon fruit off our plants than we've ever seen before. So if it didn't fruit last year, then not so good. Of course, we had a drought last year. If you didn't water it a lot at the same time, it might have not made any flowers because of that. This year we have plenty of moisture in the ground. Well, we might give it a chance because we got the water this year to keep it moisture. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, last year, I, I, I'm leasing a house right now and the homeowner had planted dragon fruit all over the yard. And uh, last year we had fruit forming on plants that we didn't think would ever fruit because they were in bad locations and you know against between houses and things and they all fruited. Everything fruited last year, so. Yes. Well, next year is possible. It's possible. Um, I mean, you know, if, it's nice to have a stem this fat, though. That this is this is more than ready. Whereas that's about as small as you can get. But. Yes. So the ones on the table, um, mm -hmm. those are ready for the ground now, or would you yeah. grow them taller and then wait for the Oh, no. You want to get dragon fruit into its permanent location as fast as you can because it's so bulky. It's just hard to handle them in pots. They just keep falling over if they're in a small pot. So those are good. Right. Yeah. right. Yes. What, uh, what happens in your opinion, uh, what are the fast tasting varieties? We'll go over that in a moment. Yeah. Well, productivity, it's the white one. The original white one still fruits the best, so it's nice to just to have one of those around. But uh, it's definitely not the best tasting. So. Fertilizer-wise, they're not that picky. But we like uh, the fruit tree fertilizers, the main things are the nitrogen and the potassium in the ground in orange county we got plenty of the middle number of phosphorus we don't worry about that number at all but the first and the last the potassium will give you bigger fruit um the first number gives you more growth as long as you do it often it's nice you know the granular ones and the dry ones generally last longer the fish ones work fine you just have to do it every few weeks you just have to keep at it so. and if you're in a pot you'd have to fertilize more than you would in the ground because things leach through the pots faster so here's a picture of dragon fruit forming on the branches and the different colors of dragon fruit so this would be the darker red one uh, the white ones look like that. But they come anywhere between almost a burgundy and almost white. So there are light pink, medium pink, fluorescent pink. This is close to being a floor. There are some pink ones uh, that are kind of a mauvey pink that are really striking when you open them up. Of course, the white ones themselves are pretty striking when you cut through them. So. Different species, yes, Selenocerius. Um, the so a lot of people like the yellow ones uh, the best. The fruit is small. The fruit actually has spines on it, although they're easy to pick out of the out of the skin. Uh, but it does take five months for that crop to ripen, which is far longer than any other dragon fruit. So you don't get as much off. But, but there's a lot. We're growing some in the back. I don't have enough for cuttings to make cuttings of them yet. 
Uh, and there are other versions of this fruit that are yellow now too. We just got some that are called Israel yellow, but it'll be, we just planted the cutting, so it'll be a while before we can sell anything on that. So we don't, we haven't eaten them yet. We don't know how good they are. The yellow one is good, but I still like uh, certain ones the best. So we'll go over those. Um, the person who kind of introduced dragon fruit to the United States uh, wrote this book, Paul Thompson. This is, he brought it back in the 60s and uh, he was doing a lot of breeding himself and he assigned them numbers and letters like 7S, 10S and he sent these cuttings across the country and they and then people didn't really really like the uh, way he had named them so everybody they got, got assigned uh, names uh, that were popular during that Time in the late 60s, early 70s, so you'll notice the names of these things like uh, uh, Purple Haze, um, the most people's favorite, although there's a couple that are close, uh, Physical Graffiti. I'm sure I spelled that right. Um, this is my favorite that I've eaten so far. It's got the fluorescent flesh. Might have a little more green on the skin than this one, but it's close. Um, this one has a more, more acidic flavor. Kind of kiwi-like. Instead of just being sweet, it's got sweetness and the richness of the flavor so but one is very close if not and some people like this one better is American Beauty they look very similar whoops and I have some rooted cuttings of American Beauty but we have the so uh, there's a, the expert over at the field station. So the field station in Irvine is where they do a lot of research on this. So if you drive by the field station on Irvine Boulevard, Tribuco Road, you'll see rows and rows of dragon fruit there. And uh, uh, Romero Lobo is the uh, main researcher. He says American Beauty has got two names. Uh, well, a lot of these have two names or even more. Uh, it's also known as Bienho Red. And that's how ours is labeled in the back. We have a bigger one back in the back. Um, awful good too, close to physical graffiti. I mean, Halley's Comet, I'm not sure I spelled that right, but another one. So these are like the top three or four. Purple Haze is a, a little bit less. Now one of our friends, uh, Tony Pacheco, who is, who was growing a lot of dragon fruit for restaurants and farmers markets says the one he's asked for the most the fruit wise is Al Gruyo. So Al Gruyo is different it's a lot spinier um, stems bigger spines instead of being greenish it's more bluish colored and the fruit uh, has got no acidity. It's just sweet. So some pits, a lot of his customers prefer this one. No acidity, just sweet. And we have, uh, we can get cuttings, a cutting or two off of that also in the back of the store. So. Now, one of the, now Paul Thompson died a number of years ago. One of the modern, the newer guys, though, there's Another guy who did a lot of, of um, breeding was Leo Manuel, but currently one of the guys doing a lot of breeding is Edgar. So this is Edgar's baby, but Edgar Valdivia does a lot of breeding work in, in them too. And a lot of the newest ones that people want are from his collection. So Edgar's baby is supposed to be one of his best. I haven't eaten it yet. I've got a, 
his plants were distributed from a tissue culture company about three years ago. And mine right now is big enough to fruit, but it has it flowered last year once, but didn't the set of fruit. So I'll have to see how good it tastes. A lot of our friends have said this is similar to physical graffiti if it's not the same. So we'll see. Um, but he's got a lot of other ones out there too. Uh, one of my employees has one of his other ones called Asunta. Asunta 2 or something like that. So now he's breeding them for sweetness. Now they're already really sweet. I don't know if you have to go, if, if continue making sweeter is a better goal or just making them more unique looking or better tasting. Otherwise, I, I don't know what's the best goal for that because they're all really, really sweet. Um, I don't have Fullerton and we're this year, another one that's incredibly sweet is Voodoo Child. Well, one we do have, so Paul Thompson's favorite that he produced is called Delight, which is a very light pink, but a real nice flavor on that too. And we do have uh, Delight cuttings. Yeah, this is uh, this is Delight. Now, dragon fruit. Uh, and as do a lot of cactus get these spots on the on the stems like this one's really spotted up and no one knows what that's from and no one really worries about it that much it always occurs on the sunny side not on the bottom side it's usually on the sunny side so it may be heat related um, they've done a lot of studies on this thing it's not a disease it seems some kind of physio physiological reaction um, it's on the same side of the plant that either the sun hits or hail would hit it and hail does make pock marks that get slightly infected so it certainly could be you know we have hail almost every year you, you might not notice it but we have hail from the winter so this certainly can be hail damage because it's on the upper side of the stems not the bottom or it could be heat that you know something a physiological reaction to heat we're not positive but uh it happens and we don't usually worry about it much because it's never caused major problems on the plant um so manuel lobo uh said that they get a lot of bird damage at the field station so they have bags like this you can buy these at michael's or hobby lobby and put them over the fruit to keep it from getting attacked by the birds. This probably wouldn't stop a raccoon or a squirrel, but it stops the birds. So these run a dollar each or so. Um, any other questions today? Oh, so there are people that are hybridizing dragon fruit and epiphyllums to get a prettier flower because most of them are just white. So someone in Germany did the first really good pink one called Connie Mayer. Epiphyllums, uh, orchid cactus. And we saw this thing, this is from my yard, and we saw this bloom a few years ago, uh, probably three years ago. Now it's more than that maybe four years ago and we said that's so pretty it can't be very good fruit and then we ate the fruit and it was good it was a pink flesh fruit with pink flowers uh flowers just as big so we were pleased with this how it turned out so that that's i mean it's not as good as the top ones but we were surprised that it was as good as it was for being the first uh, popular flop pink flowered one out there. This Michelle is also one of um, Edgar Valdivia's, I think it's named after his daughter, one L on the Michelle. So it's a real spiny one. Now the flowers on this are quite different, whereas the normal flowers Everything about them is pretty much green with just a little bit of 
that is the buds are just mainly green with a little bit of yellow uh, margins on the edge. The flowers on a lot of the ones that Edgar does have red edges to all the sepals. So the flower bud itself is quite attractive. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yes. How do you know when the fruit is ripe? Well, it turns color. Now, we've left it on the plant for up to a month. It gets a little bit softer, but it doesn't really lose that much hanging on the plant unless it's on there you know, more than a month. Uh, well, I would say two weeks on, no problem. After about a month, it gets kind of soggy and soft. Uh, so not too long, but I like to wait. You know, I would say three days after it fully colors, I like to pick it at about that time. Some commercial growers pick it green. So, uh, yes. Not much. I they can probably get root rot if they're in the wrong dirt. You know, if they're in native natural soil or in our top pot, they won't rot. You can water them as much as you want; they won't rot. I mean, they're from the tropics, and if you can grow them in Vietnam, that's really wet at times there. So that's not hurting them. But like this grower uses redwood ground up redwood sawdust that possibly can rot them if it gets uh, if it stays too wet but um, don't know a lot of fruits won't get any sweeter because the foliage the green parts of the plant create the sugars the fruit doesn't but you know, on bananas, the, the starch turns to sugar once you pick it. So I don't know about dragon fruit. I haven't picked them green to try them out. So. Okay. Um, you can come up.